Welcome to the Paul Nern Center. Um, my name is Shriya Chatterjee, and I'm head of research and learning here at the center. So now, uh, to really get to the meat of today's uh, event and to properly welcome you to what is the second um, research seminar this term. Um, this event is part of a series called In Conversation, New Directions in Art History. Some of you may have already been to our last session. Um, if not, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about what the um, series is about. So the aim uh, of the series is to really bring new research and ideas into conversation and circulation, but also to think through the approaches and methods we build along the way to how we write interdisciplinary and thought-provoking art histories. You'll be hearing from a range of very exciting speakers as a part of the series, and the topics that we will explore range from things like um, indigenous objects in British uh, and European collections, art and artificial intelligence, um, feminist revisions of chinoiserie, um, and of course, today's event, um, which is on cinema and empire. So I'll give you a brief um, outline of how the event will be run today. Um, the format of the evening will be as follows. So we'll have 15 minutes from each speaker who I'll introduce shortly. And then 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes um, for the speakers to be in conversation with each other, which really uh, and talk about their work, but also to think through methodology and how we really how we do art history. So, it, um, and then um, following that, we will have a, que a Q and A session from uh, the audience, both online and in person. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, put it in if you're online. Uh, put your questions into the Q and A section of the chat. Um, and uh, raise your hands and we'll do the old fashioned way here. Um, and this will be followed by a reception um, next door. So uh, it'd be lovely if you join us. So today's uh, speakers, we have um, Kirsty Sinclair Dutzen um, speaking on decolonizing in Technicolor, post-war color cinema in Britain and India. Um, this talk considers the relationship between color and coloniality and post-war cinema. Uh, and really thinks about the visual and imageness of cinema, but foregrounds the material, the technological, and the infrastructural elements of it. So in particular, the talk will focus on how the dyeing technique used at London's Technicolor Film Laboratory helped Britain imagine its sustained global hegemony during an era of decolonization. So the British Technicolor Lab was an international hub for processing color film from the 1930s to the 1960s, dying film that was shot all uh, across the world. So we're really looking forward to your talk. Uh, following Kirsty's talk, Erica Carter's talk, um, White Cinema Colonial Pink, uh, is going to be on white cinema going in the British colonial territories after, after World War II. Um, it draws on um, her own family history to think through cinema going practice amongst white British colonials in tropical environments. The talk focuses on color in the urban environment, specifically on the prominence uh, in downtown Nassau of the color known as colonial pink uh, and its association with color in contemporary visual practice, including amateur photography and filmmaking, as well as the movie going experiences in the city's white only showfront cinema, the Savoy. So really interesting talks to pair with, with one another as well. Um, just to introduce the two speakers to you before I hand over, uh, Kirsty Sinclair Dutzen is a lecturer in film and media studies at UCL. She received a PhD in history of art with film and media studies from Yale University in 2018. Her work, which interrogates the relationship between materials, technologies, aesthetics, and ideologies from the 19th century to the present, has been published uh, in various venues, including British Art Studies, Screen and Film History, and others. Her most recent article, co-authored with Xiao Zhu, uh, entitled, Did Madame Mao uh, Dream in Technicolor? received both Catherine Singer Kovacs Essay Award from SCMS and the Screen Biennial Award. <coughs> uh, Kirsty's first book, The Gravity's Rain, uh, the, ra <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Rainbow's Gravity, uh, Color, Materiality, and British Modernity um, will be published by the Paul Mellon Center uh, in May this year, and we'll be hearing some elements uh, from the book today. 
Right. Um, Erica Carter is Professor of German and Film at King's College London. Um, she has researched and lectured widely for many years across cultural studies, film studies, and German studies. Her co-edited volumes include Space and Place, Theories of Identity and Location, Cultural Remix, Theories of Politics and the Popular, and the BFI German Cinema book. Her writings on Weimar and Nazi film aesthetics uh, include Bella Balash, uh, Early Film Theory, and Dietrich's Coasts, The Sublime and the Beautiful in Third Reich Film. In recent years, um, her research has turned to colonial cinema and archive practice. Uh, and as we will see, the, her presentation today will build uh, on an essay on whiteness and colonial cinema in her co-authored volume, Mapping the Sensible Distribution, Inscription, Cinematic Thinking. So um, first up, we'll have Kirsty. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Shreya, um, for inviting Erica and I to speak today and the rest of the team at the PMC for putting this event together. It's a real honor to be presenting the material here, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation afterwards. Um, in, a, in a shameless double plug, I also just wanted to flag that the material I'm presenting today is drawn from my forthcoming book, The Rainbow's Gravity, Colour, Materiality and British Modernity which the PMC will be publishing in May. The book covers a period between the 1850s and 1960s, during which Britain developed a series of new colour media technologies. It asks how these material and technical changes to the way colour was made interlocked with changing social and political understandings of what colour meant. Of particular relevance to today's conversation is that the book considers the relationship between colour media and the British Empire, not simply in terms of representational politics, but examining how imperial ideologies and related racial hierarchies were fundamentally bound up with the techno-material processes of producing colour images. While the book covers painting, printing, photography, and television, today's talk is drawn from the chapter on film titled Decolonizing in Technicolor, which uses the 1953 Indian Technicolor film Jansi Ki Rani to consider the changing political resonances of making films in color in post-war Britain and India. Um, and a brief note before I begin. Ooh. For historical reasons, for historical consistency, excuse me, I'm going to retain colonial era names for Indian cities throughout my talk. So John C. Kirani was a landmark production. It was the only domestically produced Indian film ever shot in Technicolor. And this is the most prestigious, expensive, and dazzling film process available at this time. India had only produced around 10 domestic color features to date, so the Technicolor brand name was exploited as a mark of distinction by Sohrab Modi, who directed, produced, and acted in the film, and also owned Minerva Movie Tone Studios in Bombay, where Jansi Kirani was shot, and you can see him at top left here. Released six years after India won independence from Britain, Jansi Ki Rani took as its subject India's first war of independence in 1857, when the Rani, or Queen, of the Indian state of Jansi led forces in combat against the British East India Company. Drawing clear parallels between the Rani's attempts to contest British colonialism and in India's recent struggle for independence, the film attempted to present a unifying patriotic theme, despite the fact that the character of Indian nationalism and ideas of national cinema were contested due to the multiple religious, ethnic, and linguistic groups that comprised the newly formed nation of India. But this was not the first time India had appeared in Technicolor film. Technicolor, an American technology firm, opened its first British wing, sorry, its British wing in 1936, making England the only location outside Hollywood with Technicolor cameras and laboratory facilities. And British Technicolor filmmakers routinely used India as the subject of their films, reflecting the subcontinent's position in the imperial imagination as a colony rich with color. 
that had been exploited by Britain for centuries through the extraction of dye stuffs, pigments, and textiles. Yet John C. Q. Rani seemed to reverse this colonial gaze as a technical tale of British imperialism told from the perspective of a newly independent India. But imperialism is not only something depicted on film as images, but something that adheres in film as a material logic. And I contend there is a telling friction between Jansi Kirani's representational politics as an anti-imperial epic shot in India and its material politics as an object of economic imperialism printed and dyed at a laboratory in London. And it's important to note that the film was released in two versions, one in Hindi, the other a shorter English version titled The Tiger and the Flame. Sadly, there are no extant color copies of the Hindi version, and the English version only survives as a bad video transfer. But by focusing on the materiality of the film print itself, albeit lost, I want to address what Ramesh Kumar describes as the, quote, privileging of content over carrier in histories of Indian cinema, meaning that precisely because of such archival losses, scholars have tended to de-privilege the film print as their primary object of investigation. So today I want to ask what might be gained by restoring the carrier to our reading of the content, to open up new interpretive possibilities for film history by reading films as both images and as objects whose material and formal strategies are inseparable. And this is obviously uh, uh, an approach that's really familiar to art historians, and that's something we could maybe talk about in the conversation afterwards. So to do this, we need to understand the mechanics and logistics of how the film was made. To shoot in Technicolor, Modi had to hire a standard package of equipment, services, and personnel, including a special Technicolor camera and cameraman, lighting, cabling, and generators, which were all sourced from Britain. But this movement of people and materials was not unidirectional. Modi's own cameramen flew to London for training, and exposed negatives were flown there for processing at Technicolor's London lab. This was because Technicolor films could only be processed at a Technicolor laboratory due to the specialized nature of their printing technique known as dye transfer. To explain this process at its simplest, the Technicolor camera used a prism to split light into three separate color channels, red, blue, green, with the information for each recorded on three discrete black and white negatives. Each negative was turned into a gelatin printing matrix, which was then dyed cyan, yellow, magenta, then each was pressed against a blank strip of film to transfer the dye onto the celluloid and recombine the colors of the image. While other color processes involved complex photochemical development, Technicolor simply dyed its prints in a manner akin to textile printing and using dyes initially developed for the textile industry. This was both highly economical and gave unparalleled control over color because each hue could be adjusted individually. This also invested the laboratory with enormous power. As cinematographers were working in black and white, they couldn't see the color until the lab added it. One cinematographer claimed, and I quote, you really photographed the film blind. Given these limitations, it seems surprising Modi chose to work in Technicolor when rival processes had just become available that would not impose such restrictions on the production. The post-war period marked the first commercial availability of chromogenic stocks, what you might call color negative. These processes were largely derived from Agfacolor, the German system developed for propaganda cinema during the war, which required no special camera and could be processed by any lab trained in certain photochemical techniques. Although Agfacolor could not compete with Technicolor's saturation, it was cheaper and simpler and involved no external oversight. The Agfacolor patents were therefore a prized spoil of war and their global dispersal catalyzed an international wave of new chromogenic stocks 
which symbolized a range of freedoms, particularly for socialist and post-colonial nations, which were now able to buy color negative and manage their own color film productions in a meaningful way for the first time. And Modi's contemporaries certainly viewed chromogenic stocks in this liberatory way. Mehboob Khan chose chromogenic stock for his 1952 color debut on, so that rather than a technicolor cameraman, he could employ his own cinematographer, Faradun A. Irani. Producer Ambalal Patel made Pam Posh using Belgian Jiva color in 1953, hailed as a watershed for chromatic self-determination as Patel processed the feature at Film Center in Bombay, which he'd opened as India's first color lab in 1952. Yet Modi chose to shoot in Technicolor, a process associated with a British colonial gaze and which required the heavy involvement of British personnel. But the timing of Jansi Kirani's production, when Technicolor was negotiating to open a new lab in Bombay, can't be overlooked. As part of a global post-war expansion of its lab network into Asia and South America, Technicolor identified India, the world's second largest film industry, as its top priority, a prospect welcomed by the Indian government who had identified color film labs as crucial to a self-sufficient film industry. An Indian Technicolor lab staffed by local personnel would save time and money shipping prints abroad and thereby retain domestic control over color processing. This was crucial for self-representation. As Indian cinematographers lamented, Euro-American laboratory processes were calibrated around norms of whiteness and were enabled to accommodate the range of skin tones found in Indian cinema, resulting in numerous workarounds to rebalance the skin color of performers. For instance, makeup artist Ram Tipness compensated for the distorting effects of certain color film stocks with abundant pink blusher. Because chromogenic processes fixed color on the surface of film at the moment of exposure, the racial biases that were built into their photochemistry rendered darker skin tones a technological problem the lab could not resolve but merely reproduce. Technical system offered a radical reorientation of this relationship, as British filmmaker John Acumfra has argued. Rather than purporting to record and fix an external reality, an external indexical reality. Technicolor's dye transfer system, which added color at the laboratory stage and made each hue adjustable, revealed color and with it skin color and an entire system of racial taxonomy as a construction produced by, not a biological reality documented in the material process of filmmaking. As Alessandro Riango has suggested, it's telling that in black skin, white masks, Franz Fanon used the metaphor of photochemical development to describe the process by which the white viewer constructed and anchored his racial difference on the surface of his body. And thus, in Fanon's terms, and I quote, fixed me there in the sense in which a chemical solution is fixed by a dye. For a confra, it was the very lack of fixity of the dyes in Technicolor, which could be adjusted, modified, or removed entirely, that meant it disrupted the links between color and indexicality that, as Rengo argues, made photographic media such important technologies for situating skin pigmentation as the ultimate index of race itself. So despite these utopian promises, the plans for a Bombay Technicolor lab never came to fruition, and Modi had to rely upon the London lab to print and dye his film. Negatives were flown to London, but the cost of making rushes in color meant most processed film was returned in black and white, and editing was similarly conducted on a black and white print. So for all the chromatic labor undertaken on set in India, the colors of Jansi Kirani materialized in the London lab, where the dyes manufactured by imperial chemical industries would bring to life this anti-imperial tale. And it's worth remarking here that Imperial Chemical Industries, or ICI, in addition to sponsoring Technicolor films and supplying Technicolor with dyes, 
were also chief suppliers of chemical weaponry for the British government, forging a material link between hard forms of British military power and soft forms of British cultural power, reflecting what Sabina Doran calls the morbid pun on the word dying. But this dying process is vital to the film's material politics, as one of the principal battlegrounds of Indian independence had been British controls over textiles. Since the 19th century, when Jhansi Ki Rani is set, British dye works had devastated India's domestic textile industries by extracting Indian cottons to dye cheaply in England and profit from their global export. Textiles were therefore heightened symbols of Indian independence, as highlighted by the cotton spinning wheel on the nation's flag. Technical as dye transfer process echoed this historical traffic in dyed materials, both through its economic logic and its material specificity. While Modi lost 10 million rupees on Jhansi Ki Rani, Technicolor generated substantial profits, dyeing its 400 release prints. Moreover, the fact that cotton was a chief ingredient used for manufacturing film stock, which was then dyed by Technicolor using textile dyes, further confederated these links between British colonial processes of dyeing Indian fabrics and neo-colonial processes of dyeing Indian films. Technicolor's dye transfer process therefore illuminates what Bruno Latour describes as technology's capacity to, quote, carry past acts into the present through the reanimation of these historical skill sets. Or to use Jogjeet Lali's terms, we could say this dying process invites, and I quote, an acknowledgement of the historical entanglement of color with colonialism and its controlling and commodifying logics and the way in which they are reproduced and repackaged. So I hope my reading of Jhansi Kirani has illuminated what I mean by interpreting films as both images and objects, as surfaces and as substances, an approach that might open up new pathways for envisioning the relationship between matter and subject matter, particularly in the context of imperial and post-imperial image making revealing the meanings of films to be fixed neither in the contents of their images nor in their material supports, but constituted through their dynamic relationship. Thank you. I'm so excited by Kirsty's work, um, and not least because we're talking about a similar period, um, but with from a different perspective, but I think there are so many overlaps. So um, thank you. That was brilliant. Um, I'd like also to join Kirsty in thanking Shreya and the team for inviting us to speak tonight and to dialogue with each other. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. I'm going to be presenting some thoughts from the essay that, uh, from an essay in the book that Shreya um, referenced earlier on uh, the recent book on mapping where um, I have an essay that will later become part of a monograph that I'm calling White Bodies in Motion and it's about the formation of a subjectivity that I, that I want to refer to as post-war colonial whiteness um, and what you will have gathered if you've had time to read the abstract um, is that that research is in part based on an exercise in family history, so I've been using my own family history um, as one route into uh, a history of cinema going as a practice of white subjectification and community formation um, amongst a particular group of post-war British white expatriates working in territories within the British colonial service across the British overseas territories after 1945. Um, in 1943, the Colonial Office started a recruitment drive for what it called in a 1943 pamphlet a new type of white officer, demobilized soldiers then in the first instance, but also bright young working class men denied a university education by class and economic disadvantage, but trained now for careers that would grant them accelerated social mobility across the territories of the former empire. 
One such, um, one such non-university graduate was my father, John, who you see here, meet John, um, who graduated towards the end of the war from a secondary school in South London. But his family had no money for university fees, so he opted for agricultural college, then 12 years of service as a colonial agricultural officer in northern Nigeria. And meet, secondly, my mother, Anna, born Ernestina Susanna Fefonik, a southern Austrian domestic help turned au pair, turned colonial nurse in 1948, whom John encountered while both were en route to West Africa, my mother to a new posting from the Bahamas where she'd been working for three years to Ghana. My father was off to Nigeria. They had a whirlwind romance on board ship. Uh, they married and they stayed, they lived together from 1952 in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, until independence in 1960. In the research that I'm doing, I use my own childhood memories, interviews with my father, family albums, and so on, as one starting point, but really just one starting point, for a circulatory and entangled history of post-war white expatriate experience across three colonial locales where my parents worked, the Bahamas, Ghana, and Nigeria. I come to that story from years of writing and researching film and cinema and cultural history, and it's through that lens that I consider what my book will argue is the enmeshment of my parents' social lives with film as the mid-20th century's uh, defining mass popular visual medium. So I use a composite methodology. We, we're going to talk about that, I think, later on including oral history, archive and library research, obviously, but also media philosophy and anthropology, um, to investigate cinema going as a practice of white sociality and community belonging, and traveling to the movies as a spatial practice in Michel de Certeau's terms, or what uh, the cinema historian Annette Kuhn calls a geography of actions within the territories of a now emergent post-war commonwealth. Let me tell you a little bit about how I'm thinking about walking to the movies um, and as a geography of actions in, uh, in Annette Kuhn's sense. Um, Kuhn's study is an oral history of cinema going in, in 1930s Britain. Um, and she, she talks about how her interlocutors will constantly talk about the walk to the, mu to the movies um, as a, and draw a kind of memory map of, um, of, of what they remember. They don't remember the films often, but they remember walking, th walking to the movies. Um, walking then figures, Kuhn writes, uh, as a pragmatic practice of bodily mobility. It's also the default method of getting around for her 1930s generation of interwar film, film goers. She talks about it also as a way of practicing belonging or non-belonging to place through bodily immersion in the built environment and open space. And it's that part of um, Kuhn's work, this notion of uh, traveling through uh, through urban space that I use in the work that I've recently published on my mother's movie-going movie, movie -going experiences in colonial Nassau in the Bahamas. Uh, Anna travelled to the Bahamas in 1948. She worked in the Bahamas General Hospital, but she was also incoming from post-war austerity Britain, and she enjoyed all sorts of leisure possibilities offered by white life in a tropical colonial capital. So she traveled around Nassau, as well as the archipelago's incredibly far-flung family island groupings. She went on holiday to Jamaica at some point, and she went to the movies. Um, I've been using Monique Toppins. She's a colleague at the University of the Bahamas, and she's done a really important oral history of cinema going, again, um, around the same period as I'm working on in the post-war Bahamas. So I've spent time, and you'll see a map in a minute, tracing plausible routes for my mother's walks to the movies during the three years of her NASA sojourn. Um, but what I'm showing you is a slightly different map to start off with, to, to sort of illustrate in a way what's at stake in walking through colonial NASA. NASA. This is a 1912 map, so it's much earlier, um, but many of the contemporary tourist maps of Nassau will tell you the same thing, which is they'll present a city which is profoundly racially segregated uh, between, uh, between the North Shore downtown area and, 
and the south of the city. So you see here a downtown area um, in, in the northern part of the map running along the north shore of the island of New Providence on which Nassau is located with the most significant public buildings from the colonial era, Parliament House, the law courts, behind them the library, the colonial office, situated in Parliament Square over to the uh, sort of mid-east of, of this map. Um, uh, just off Bay Street, which is the city's premier boulevard and the site that was dominated by a commercial and trading white and brown local, um, so-called Bay Street oligar uh, oligarchy. They're referred to as the Bay Street boys. So it's a white space also that, uh, that is occupied by incoming tourists from uh, ships that are, that are docking at the Prince George Wharf on the North Shore. Contrast now this downtown area with the territory south, uh, to the south of the map. You have there a blank space that's irrelevant for this white travel guide, a space then of horror vacui that is from the perspective of this map's white tourist addressees, um, simply vacant, but in fact housed a network of black suburbs known collectively as Over the Hill, there is a hill, um, and comprising black neighborhoods dating back to periods of settlement of freed slaves and other migrant po populations from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So this map, I think, highlights quite clearly what's at stake in terms of class and racial politics in, in the practice of walking through urban space in colonial Nassau. And I, there's also all sorts of other um, uh, other kind of limits and boundaries that within down the downtown area that I talk about at greater length in, in my recent writing. In a recent book on what he calls the logic of racial practice, the philosopher of race Brock Bala recasts what de Certeau calls spatial practice as a racialized and racializing process, the source, he writes, of embodied habits that become sedimented into our ways of being in the world, instilling within us racialized and raci racist dispositions, positions, and bodily comportments. And it's with that, those comments in mind that I think about, this is my DIY map of my mother walking uh, to the cinema from the Bahamas General Hospital, that's the a blue circle with the white square down to uh, the Savoy, which was Nassau's whites only segregated cinema. That walk would have taken Anna a mere 15 minutes. Um, she would, I, I, I speculate, um, having done this walk many times, have walked down one of the city's main thoroughfares, Shirley Street, through the elegant tropical gardens and squares surrounding government buildings, that's those three sort of red and, you know, the castle type things, so government buildings, including the National Assembly and the Colonial Office. It's the obvious way to go if you're walking. Um, then westwards up Bay Street, as, which as I said, was Nassau's kind of premier business district. Um, and a but was also a destination of choice, not just for, for, the business, uh, for the business elite, also for Nassau residents, obviously it was a shopping area, um, but also for incoming um, black and mixed shoppers and traders from the Bahamas scattered family islands. It's a massive archipelago, as many of you will know. Uh, this was also a space for black laborers, market traders, and service personnel for downtown business and tourist outlets and for predominantly white and in the majority in this period US American tourists who are decanted on the shorefront from cruise liners and luxury yachts. So what you have in downtown Nassau is a context that promotes unusually intimate contact. It's a really small town, Nassau. Um, unusually intimate contact between highly differentiated and hierarchized social and racial groups. So the question how to be white in that context, I think, is a question of particular, of particular significance for somebody like my mother, who is coming, who has to, who who is kind of profiling herself as a, a representative of um, a colonial presence. And now we come to the relationship between white cinema, and colonial pink. Um, I want to show you some images of the Savoy, which uh, was probably the only segregated cinema in the West Indies, that at least according to the historian James Burns. It was also a prominent landmark on the Nassau 
waterfront. So you see here how the Savoy attracted attention through a glowing pink facade, which made it a spectacular focal point for incoming tourists or shoppers or um, just for sort of passing maritime traffic. That status as a landmark and focus of attention was reinforced by the Savoy's architectural and chromatic resonances with other urban landmarks. Um, so this is um, the Savoy is painted. The Savoy is painted in the colour I'm calling colonial pink, although Kirsty and I might want to talk about that later. Uh, as far as I can tell, this was the paint colour that was supplied by the Crown agents and unofficially prescribed during the colonial period for Bahamian government buildings. It's still today the standard set by Bah the Bahamian Department of Public Works um, for courts, administration buildings, public health clinics, and so on. What happens, so as you walk through the city, what you're walking through is a kind of city-wide pink-hued latticework. This is Parliament Square, uh, a postcard from 1904, which is a veritable rhapsody in colonial pink, so the colour kind of engulfs the Parliament buildings facing Bay Street, the law courts and the library. The Parliament buildings are said to be modelled on Tyrone Palace, New Bern, which is, was capital of the North Carolina colonial government until the American Revolution. So there's a reference, and there is throughout, I mean, I won't go into this history in great detail, but there are all sorts of architectural references to the loyalist populations who came after the, war, after the American War of Independence, who moved to various places all outside the southern states, including the Bahamas, because they were loyal to the British crown. And the loyalists uh, significantly shaped the sort of the architectural uh, milieu of downtown Nassau. So there's a reference, there's a, a significant reference to colonial heritage in, uh, in, oops, in, Parliament, in Parliament Square. Just a few more examples. Um, I don't want to move the slide on. Here we go. Just a few more examples of this, what I'm calling this kind of pink lattice work. So this, for example, is the Fort Montague Beach Hotel, which was constructed in 1926 in spectacular pink with its own private beach, which was the site of a vigorously enforced form of Jim Crow segregation. This is an undated tourist map which continues that preoccupation with a pink-blue color palette, um, as does this 1950s tourist brochure. So pink, this pink-blue um, relationship, uh, the, the kind of palette of colonial, color palette of colonial heritage is mapped now onto a landscape and a marine environment whose coloration lends the patina of a natural order to colonial divisions and hierarchies. What I do in my, the essay that I've written is I talk about the experience of walking through this, this kind of um, nostalgia fest of various moments in uh, colonial history. I'm not gonna talk about that because I want to try out on you finally a few new things that I've been doing with this um, kind of chromatic story, but just one reference to this sort of history of walking or this account of walking to the movies. I've been very influenced by, for ex by work that's going on on, on what, the, um, what the Chinese cinema historian Chen Zhu Zhou has called atmospheric spectatorship, so a form of spectatorship that moves in and out of the cinema and is very much concerned also with the experience of going in, moving within and beyond um, the cinema space. But I want, to, I want to continue the story of Pink a little bit. Um, in the new chapter that I'm currently working on, I use a focus on the color pink to work intertextually across media forms, including the illustrated press, so I'm moving away from the urban fabric, um, to the illustrated press, fashion, film, of course, advertising, but also painting and artisanal crafts, especially straw making, to think about how pink provides not just in Anna's walk to the cinema, but in other contexts of racialized praxis, the chromatic mise-en-scene for performances of colonial whiteness. One prime source for my next chapter is the Nassau magazine that you just saw um, in the previous slide, and I can't find the mouse, so I can't work out how to go back to it, um, which was a publication launched for a high society tourist readership in the mid-1930s by the Bahamas Development Board. 
By the 1940s, it was attracting a new class of moneyed middle-class visitors, so tourists were rubbing shoulders. Uh, I am going to try and find that. Or can I perhaps take it back this way? Will that go? Yeah. Tourists were rubbing shoulders in clubs, hotels, or as here on private beaches, with the Bay Street commercial and political elite, as well as with British aristocrats, business tycoons, and colonial officials. They also mingled with glamour figures from post-war fashion, sport, and film. So this is from the inside of the Nassau magazine, a memorable photo gallery from a 1949 issue of the Nassau magazine showing Errol Flynn, a notorious sexual predator whom my mother remembered luring nurses from her, resident, from her residence to parties on his private yacht. Or in the bottom right, the British star David Farrer, who reprises in this glamour shot his role in the Powell and Pressburger uh, drama of late empire Black Narcissus, where he plays the horseback riding British agent gone native Mr. Dean. So this is an issue, this particular issue celebrates a new era in uh, the development of the Bahamian white middle class milieu, an, an era that saw the Hollywoodization of social life in downtown Nassau. But just finally, the front cover of a 1942 Nassau magazine anniversary edition tells a different story where Hollywood glamour is competing for position in island, island visual culture with colonial references that go back further than the loyalist moment that I was talking about just now in relation to architecture and the urban fabric um, to an earlier moment of colonial incursion, the so-called discovery of the new world with the arrival in the Bahamas um, of Christopher Columbus on the, quote, beautiful beach of Guanahini, as, it, as the magazine calls it, on the Bahamian island of San Salvador in, on October the 12th, 1492. This cover page from 1942 is a graphic adaptation of the maritime painter and poster artist Norman Wilkinson's fantasy rendering in oil paint of Columbus making landfall in the same place in Graham's Bay, San Salvador. But I think the difference between the two images is interesting. In the Nassau magazine, Wilkinson's painting is compositionally and chromatically refigured. So his lone ship is inserted into a densely populated narrative tableau of colonial conquest, um, Columbus coming onto the beach. The dominant blue of the seascape, meanwhile, is adjusted to give greater prominence to the pastel pink space of the beach, stretched now into a wide pink strip, and the, the sands are pink. There are coral beaches, pink coral beaches all over the, but not all over the Bahamas, but on some of the Bahamas islands. Um, the glow of the beach is enhanced by a maritime blue that deepens the, the turquoise hue of Wilkinson's ocean. I just feel so sorry for Kirsty. Um, evoking more centrally the enticement of the 1950s tourist brochure that I showed earlier. So there's a process of intertextual relay from an oil painting's majestic scenario of colonial conquest to its touristic refiguring in an image of pink coral sands, not the ocean, as the site of human agency and colonial agency on the Bahamas Islands. That intertextual relay is extended on the back page to link pink beaches to a more explicit, explicitly touristic fantasy. So this is an illustrated advert, advert from the Bahamas Development Board. It repeats the contours of the coastline that you get in Wilkinson's painting and then again in the front cover. Um, but the illustration performs a kind of temporal and scalar shift. So you move in closer um, and you come up to the present day. Uh, so that the beach is figured as a contemporary site of tourist frolics in which we participate as we move in closer. So the perspective here is of uh, somebody, a sort of family member, taking a holiday snapshot. What I want to do in the rest of my work, and I'm going to finish now, uh, is to follow uh, one of the really influential um, works for the, the work that I've been doing on the Bahamas is this fantastic book, which I'm sure many of you will know, Krista Thompson's, an eye for the tropics. I want to follow Krista Thompson in exploring under her rubric of the tropical picturesque, the similar chromatic and compositional reworkings of colonial visual scenarios into touristic fantasy. 
What I'm doing is working across media, so I'm looking at the illustrated press, advertising, fashion, film, and so on, also amateur film, and indeed my mother's own photo album, to explore how the rose-colored spaces of post-war Nassau became locations for vernacular performances of whiteness on the streets and beaches of the tropical Bahamas. I was really taken by this advert in the Nassau magazine, which uh, advertises the streets and hotels of downtown Nassau as creative milieu for what it calls the art of living, where life is a brilliant gesture. Uh, what I'm doing then is I'm currently trawling my mother's photo al album, so that's her on the right, to explore how she responded that, to that invitation to experience life in Nassau as a brilliant gesture. Uh, with performances of selfhood that replicate the tropical mise-en-scene and gestural configurations of glamour, fashion, and high society photography in the Nassau magazine, as here, where she poses against a palm in a straw hat with a pose that, that kind of evokes this earlier poster in the Nassau magazine, or the ubiquitous shot of um, the, triumph, uh, the triumphant fishing. I've yet to find a... Uh, an equivalent for this gesture, but I rather like it as a final tribute to my um, otherwise occasionally difficult mother. But um, uh, um, but anyway, this is uh, that's I, I don't I do, I just wanted to sort of talk about pink as a mise en scène for these kinds of performances that I'm now exploring. Thanks very much, and I do hope Kirsty, you're all right. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this. And it was such an exciting talk and so fabulous to see some extra images that aren't in the chapter as well. Um, I suppose like, one of the questions that I'd love to get started with is thinking, you know, in, in the spirit of the, the name of this event, thinking about methodology. Um, so one of the things that I think is so interesting that connects our work is thinking about new methods for connecting film and empire beyond representational politics necessarily. Obviously, representation and aesthetics is important to both of our work. Um, but thinking about this relationship between the empire and film technology um, in these kind of different ways, whether that's technomaterial, um, whether that's technomaterial or kind of sensory and effective, um, and I'd love for us to kind of speak a bit more about that, about um, how our work is kind of thinking through different ways of engaging with um, what in some ways is a conventional, you know, set of discursive topics of, of the empire and film, that this seems to be something different from kind of historical legacies of how those things have been thought together. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I don't quite know how to, I, well, let, let, let me just start it. I think that partly what's happening has to do with a huge explosion of uh, a huge explosion of the discipline of whatever we're going to call it screen studies. You know what is it anyway? You know I I think that um, that concern with representation seems to be to be no, I mean it's there and the concern with narrative and so on. But whether it's central or not, that really depends where you are. Um, so I think that. In, in that context, it, that's part of what's happening. So um, your work is really, I would say, in the vanguard of a whole new uh, field, which is, a, which is really looking at colour techniques. I noticed that one of your slides used um, an image from Barbara Flückiger's work on the historical timeline of, the timeline of historical colours. You know, there have been big projects that have... You know, perhaps you could talk a bit more about that. I mean, what's enabled my work, I think, has been a conjunction of, it's a funny, it's a funny old conjunction of, on the one hand, cinema history, which I'm not doing, because I'm not, I'm not doing what tends to be called the new cinema history <coughs> in any obvious way, because that's, that's often about... <coughs> you okay? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, that's often very, very, it's more in the direction of social science than I want to go. Um, but there is a lot of discussion of how you think about the experience of going to the cinema, and that's also opened up ways of thinking across 
from social science paradigms which are looking at transport networks or, um, uh, or, or you know, obviously socioeconomic factors that influence cinema going, um, urban studies, you know, all, all that kind of thing. But on the other hand, really media aesthetics and media philosophy that is thinking about experience um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so I, I, think, I think there's something that's happening in the discipline that we both move around in um, that is enabling some of this work. Yeah, and I think what's, what's really exciting about this work is, as you say, it's, it's not just film history without films, which is, yeah, and I realise that we're a room full of art historians as well, so we can talk a bit more about the art historical dimension of this, but um, it's, it's not just film history without films, but thinking about an entire kind of an activation of an entire sensory environment with film still at the centre of that, still being at the centre of the, the gravity of that history. Um, but I, I love that idea of the entire kind of topography becoming mise-en-scene or becoming activated as a sensory environment um, in which film is, is contextualised, that that kind of sensory and effective history um, not purely being about the sensory experience of watching the film mm. is, is, is such an exciting new dimension to kind of push that in. Um, and yes, certainly, you know, you flagged um, Barbara Flukiger's work and there's been, there's been, and obviously Sarah Street's work as well, there's been phenomenal kind of techno material and social histories of, of colour film um, that I'm drawing on. But what I'm, I'm so interested in, in, in my work specifically, is kind of drawing these art historical methods into thinking about film, that for art historians, I think what I'm saying is so <laughs> conventional, right? <laughs> to say, imagine if we looked at what the actual ma materials an object was made from and how that informed its, its social and political resonances. For art historians, that's art history kind of one-on-one, right? Um, but it's, it's so exciting to bring that work into film studies um, to draw on that amazing kind of technical history that's been done, we're so much more used to thinking about um, technologies and apparatuses than we are about materiality in some ways. Um, so I, I find that a really exciting kind of way of drawing together these disciplines um, to kind of produce new readings um, that might not be possible in kind of more conventional approaches to say, like there's, there's so much great work on cinema and empire um, and, and it really important work's been done about issues of representation and historical representation and aesthetics and narrative, but what, what else is there to say? Um, and drawing on art historical methods is, is one way of producing these new readings. There's also, I mean, one of the things that we came up with when we were sort of discussing crossover points in our work, we, we wanted to talk about intermediality, I think, um, and what that meant for two of us, for the two of us, because I, I mean, it's sort of in a peculiar sort of way, the work that I'm doing has been very much influenced by work on digital media, which talks precisely about moving through, moving through digital environments and all sorts of terms like um, navigating, for example, um, which are used to think about how we live within within mediatized worlds now. And I, I actually think that, the, you know, there's this sort of notion that that's new. Um, and I, I, I find that very puzzling because it seems to me that we've been living in mediatized worlds for a really, really long time. They haven't been digital worlds necessarily, but this whole sort of proliferation of media forms which make sense of everyday life for us and which populate everyday life. You know, that's not something that happened with the transition to the digital. But I wondered, so that's what intermediality means for me. It's sort of traveling across media forms and, and, and you know, th those, those media forms becoming the means of sense for daily life, if you like. But I wondered what intermediality means for you, because your book is not just about film. Yeah, I d before talking about that. I, I just want to say it was, it was so interesting to see of watching the slides from out there while coughing some of those other media objects as you said and you mentioned so, so um, kind of fashion magazines, press, straw making, right. Um, it's so interesting to think about these as not kind of periphery or secondary as not kind of here's the archival object that holds up the film object to think about these as really kind of integrated and as a kind of dispersal of kind of cinematic experience 
um, and how that, as you say, interlocks with kind of ideas about producing whiteness. Um, that, that, that what's really powerful about this is not hierarchizing those objects, which I, I really like. Um, for me, so yeah, it's, it's interesting intermediality because at once the work seems super medium specific, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm literally going to drill down to what celluloid is made out of. It's very specific about how this film is printed. Um, but certainly the book, yeah, each, each chapter is about a different medium. But what's interesting to me, and I was kind of gesturing at this with the, the Bruno Latour towards the end, which I've borrowed from Jennifer Roberts, is that the way of kind of opening up these objects is to think about um, Morgan Uncles' these cognate technologies. So thinking about film printing being akin to textile dyeing, being akin to um, other historical forms of um, printing on paper. Um, and that's kind of, for me, what intermediality means, are these kind of technological and material overlaps. So the, the, you know, the material overlap of cotton between film stock and, and textiles, um, that, for me, that's a location of intermediality um, rather than sort of thinking about the movement of, say, iconography across different media forms. It's really kind of where are the sites of um, overlap between how these media technologies work. And, and film and print is one that I'm particularly interested in and I've drawn a lot on print scholarship and uh, Jennifer Roberts' work, Jennifer Chong's work. Um, to think about how do we interpret a, a film print as a print. Um, so it's, it's kind of this strange maneuver of being very medium specific and also thinking about how these medias are in <coughs> excuse me, material and technical networks with other objects as well. I wonder whether we should just do one more question and then, and then open up. Um, or, yeah, would that, or yeah. should we open yeah. up no, now? No, yeah. We, we have a whole complex of things that we wanted to talk about, which was, which was about this moment, because we share a moment. Um, mm. It is the post-war shift into, you know, it's the post-war moment of decolonization and Cold War, and also Britain trying to sort of shift from empire to commonwealth and develop different kinds of dependency and new dependencies across the sort of newly liberated territories of former British Empire and so on, so we're, we're both very interested in that intermediate or transitional moment. Um, and I just want, one of the things that really struck me listening to you was the way in which every move in that, in that process is contested and ambivalent. Mm. That actually, you know, when, when you were saying about the struggles to set up, or the, the you know the attempt to set up a a colour lab, a processing lab in Bombay, but in the end it comes back to Britain. Um, I I was thinking about something rather different, which is about the kind of contestation that's going on in the Bahamas between you know is this a territory it belongs nominally to the British Empire, but they really can't. They start prospecting for oil. They can't find oil. They can't. There's not very much they can extract except from image, for images from the Bahamas. You know, it's this glorious tropical paradise and so on, which means that it's laid open for exploitation by the American tourist industry. Um, and there's all sorts of things that are going on there where the British are really not doing very well at keeping the Bahamas within their own sphere of influence. And a lot of that is around film and all the associated sort of leisure industries. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a question, but it is, it's something about not, not being able, you know, there's no radical break from empire to commonwealth. There's no, you know, it's just how, how you work out this process of the forging of new, new networks, new circuits, new dependencies, new interdependencies. Um, I don't know if you've got a comment on that. Yeah, I, well, two things there. I think one of the things that's so nice about pairing these papers together is thinking about how localized and regional those processes were, and as you say, the kind of redrawing of lines, the reimagination of empire constantly, but also in these very different regional contexts. Um, I love the idea that the only thing you can extract is images. I, I, it's just like a really um, powerful turn of phrase. I know we've, we've talked before about um, different forms of extraction, like what do you extract when you don't extract? 
cotton or, or sugar. Um, and I think the American question is a really interesting one um, for my work as well. Um, that this moment in the 50s is this shift of kind of geopolitical power where the empire is waning, becoming the Commonwealth. American kind of cultural imperialism is f moving in to f fill this gap. And those kind of, I think, both of the contexts we're looking at are these kind of frontiers. Um, in your case, in terms of um, leisure and tourism, um, I also, you know, the, so interesting that the colonial pink has kind of American historical kind of legacies, that it comes from America, but it sounds like it's some kind of British imposition, but it actually comes from southern kind of plantation aesthetics. Um, so, so your context of, of um, tourism, and then for me, obviously, um, you know, post-independence, India's the second largest film industry, and everyone is moving, is looking to move into this market, and so it becomes a big Cold War battleground, um, and, and colour technologies are very heavily ideologically freighted in the Cold War, so there's lots of interesting international co-productions, so there's a, um, a Soviet Indian co-production in 57 that's in Sov colour, which is one of these Russian post-war colour systems. Um, Technicolour is looking to move in, Britain is also trying to keep um, a kind of foot in this market. And so it's interesting, this kind of intersection of, as you're saying, kind of decolonization as well as this kind of rise of the American kind of imperium at the same time that produces these very different kind of nexus of um, kind of cultural objects as well, right? How this transforms the objects that are produced. And I, I love the comparison of the kind of family photographs with these highly mediated posed images that this kind of informs also kind of the aesthetics of the everyday as well. And there's also, I mean, this would be the last thing I, I want to say, but yet absolutely one must not forget um, that bah black Bahamian populations, for example, are absolutely inserting themselves in that, in that contestation around colour, for example. So there's a whole, that's why straw making is in there because it's a local craft that's particularly led by the women of the outer islands and the villages in the interior. So, you know, the poorer you are, the further south you live is sort of one way of thinking about New Providence. It's not quite right, but, um, it, you know, the, certainly the wealth is concentrated on the north shore of Nassau. Um, uh, but there are market women bringing in straw products which had died locally. Um, in, in the villages or in the out islands, and there's a whole local industry that develops around that, which is a tourist industry, and which brings in money for, and then the colonial authorities start to train some of the market. It's totally unregulated, and of course that's not, that's not, that's frowned upon. Um, but then, with the thing that I'm chasing at the moment, so if anybody knows this, please tell me. I want to know at what point synthetic raffia comes in as a decoration for the straw because there's now a return to so-called native dyeing, but that starts to die out in the period the time to die out, as it were, um, your pun, yeah. um, in the period the time you came out. So there's a huge contestation about mm. these things. I'm, I'm conscious of, um, <laughs> sorry, Shreya, I'm conscious of time, so should we hand over to you at this point? I don't know if this is on. Uh, hand over. Let me really hand over to, to you. Um, so I think, thank you. Um, and we can you know, sort of keep talking about some of the strands that you picked up. Um, is this working? Sorry, we're having a couple of sound issues. Yes, um, yeah, so, uh, questions from the audience? Um, Thank you very much for both uh, of the very interesting talks. And I got um, at a point or to a question with your talk, really, because with this DIY card, I was just wondering, there were two more uh, film pieces. So does that mean there were two more cinemas in that place? And your mother just went to one of them, or did she there, go? There were, when she first arrived, there were four cinemas. One was the Savoy. Um, one was, I mean, this is where I'm very reliant on um, I'm aware that there's a picture of my mother. That is. <laughs> I'd forgotten that was still up there. I'd just seen it in the mirror. Um, uh, there, there was another cinema on Bay Street called the Nassau, which was supposedly um, non-segregated, but 
Um, I'm very reliant on my colleague Monique Toppin here, but um, her oral history tells us that it was very seldom used by white uh, by white cinema girls. Um, and then and then there were two further cinemas back in over the hill, which which catered to black populations. There was one which was set up by a black... On they were all owned by a single cinema entrepreneur. He had a monopoly on the cinemas, and there was an attempt to break into the market by a black cinema entrepreneur, but um, he couldn't get the distribution. Um, there was very savage competition around distribution, and in the end, he was bought out. But one thing to say about the, about the segregated cinema is that, of course, these things are a fiction. Um, so there were people who passed for white who went into the cinema, but there were equally, I, there was somebody who I interviewed in one of my oral history interviews who comes from one of the loyalist families. He comes from the line in the loyalist family where a white planter, a white planter had come to the Bahamas from the southern, one of the southern states, uh, had an African wife, um, and he comes from that line. Um, he himself is... His, his skin tone is tendentially white, but his sister had a slightly darker skin tone and never dared to try, and I heard that story a lot from people who could have passed for white or came from very privileged elite families but didn't go to the Savoy because they didn't feel that they, they didn't want to be turned away. So, and then, of course, the other way around, people who would pass, and, and, and that's a common story of segregated... <laughs> public spaces. Thank you very much. <laughs> Could I ask a follow-up question, actually, before handing over um, to further audience questions? Um, and this is to Erica um, as well. Um, I really like the way that you were weaving in. Think about um, whiteness and the performance of whiteness, but especially in relation to um, the creation of a tropical picturesque and how that f feeds into um, kind of leisure and tourism with uh, America later and so on. Um, and then going back to kind of the pink and plantation pink <laughs> as well. But I think the, the question that kind of kept gnawing at me through, throughout um, is the question of what this performance uh, really means for kind of a broader racial politics where if i mean it is segregate, segregated to white and white passing people but what about black black bohemians are they and their relationship to film and film going um and as, as well as the kind of the the distinction between sort of the performance of whiteness and the creation of whiteness which is um you know a very specific thing versus the, the kind of the interactions or the segregation and really the, the sort of uh, tools of resistance and what color is resistance, is there resistance? And yes, I, I think I was curious about whether that plays a, a, a role in your story. Absolutely. Um, I, I didn't bring her story into it because I could have gone on and on about that for a long time. But um, one of the things I'm going to try and do in the book, or I will do in the book, I am doing in the book, um, is always putting this story into conversation with exactly the story that you're talking about. When I talked about an entangled history, the entanglements won't just be amongst my white group. So there's a very significant figure uh, in the nursing profession in that period called Hilda Bowen, who is one of the very first. She's one of a cohort of three Bahamian nurses who go in the year that my mother arrives in the Bahamas. She takes, they both come on the Queen Mary. My mother travels on the Queen Mary to New York. She travels on the Queen Mary back to the UK. And Hilda Bowen trained and worked in the UK for a long time, but went back to the Bahamas in, I can't remember the exact year, the end of the 1950s. She sort of shuttled backwards and forwards because she kept getting new professional qualifications. And she eventually became the first black matron of, um, of the hospital where my mother worked. One of the things I love about Hilda Bowen is that she was a media star. She made her such, she was, she was a consummate manipulator of, of monochrome media. So she, she did things like she developed an insignia for the local nursing, for the nursing population. She was constantly being photographed. Um, she was always, in, people talk about how she dressed, she was always incredibly well turned out. So she, it was, a, that was a kind of consummate form of black performance, of 
which, which was absolutely pitted against um, the things that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I will, I will, and I have a cinema story about Hilda Bowen, which is that she, uh, one of the doctors who I interviewed, wanted to take her to the cinema and she never responded to the invitation. He didn't know about segregation, um, and, but she was absolutely attuned to that and you know, just never took up the invitation because she couldn't go to the cinema. Interesting, thank you. Um. Uh, yeah, terrific presentations, thank you so much. Um, can I ask Kirsty a question about the materiality of the archive? Um, I was really struck. You said that Yani Kirani was printed in, there were 400 Technicolor prints of it, and yet we have no copy of it. What, what does that tell us about, you know, the fragility of this very specific archive, and, and how can that possibly be? Thank you. Yeah, I should, I should say, and I, I keep saying this as a way to strong arm the BFI, um, the, the colour separation negative, so the three strips of black and white, are actually held at the BFI. Um, which is interesting. So one of the things about Technicolor is because the camera negatives are black and white, they um, um, are not as prone to fading as color prints. So one of the famous things about these chromogenic stocks is they tend to fade to pink, as you probably noticed on the slide. Um, so we actually have these incredibly stable camera negatives of the film in the British Film Institute. Um, Hopefully that will be restored at some point. Um, but yeah, you raise a really good question that there were an enormous number of copies of this film, both in Hindi and in English. So what could have happened to them? Um, it's a very good question. Obviously, these are in circulation and movement film is incredibly fragile. Um, we're out of the era of, of nitrate by this point. They've probably not gone up in flames. Um, the question of archiving is interesting though. So the, the Ramesh Kumar um, piece that I cite about the privileging of content over of um, content over carrier, he's speaking about this in relation to the state of the National Film Archive of India, which actually suffered an enormous fire um, in I think it was 2003 and lost a huge amount of prints, largely nitrate, so from the silent era. Um, but because of in part um, a lack of kind of consummate institutional archiving um, domestically in India, um, but also the question of why do we not have release prints of this film in Britain is a really good question. Um, and I kind of defer to um, Grazia Ingravali's recent work, and she thinks about this question of what she calls Anglo-Indian film heritage and a, a strong emphasis on the hyphen, this idea that kind of coloniality, uh, you know, to, to borrow Erica term, kind of entangles or enmeshes both you know, colonizer and colonized. And so the question of kind of whose, whose film heritage is this is a really interesting question, and one that Grazia's work is dealing with um, in incredibly smart ways. Um, so I think the, the, also the question of what, which archive would we go to to look for this object? Um, where does it belong as this like truly kind of hyphenized Anglo-Indian film object? It's, it's a really interesting one. And yeah, if, if anyone knows of a secret stash <laughs> of release, technical or die transfer release prints of John C. Kirana, it happens, it happens, it might show up. But, but hopefully the BFI will restore the... Um, color separation legs. Um, there's actually a follow-up, well, not follow-up question, but a question that relates quite um, directly to this one from our online audience. Um, Rohit Tiwari um, asks, do we know how much a single print of Chassi Girani would have cost for developing and shipping back to India, and what would be today's equivalent? It's a really good question. Um, I, don't, I don't have the numbers <laughs> to hand. I can tell you that Technicolor accounted for a third of the entire budget of the film, and it was, um, I think, one of, if not the most expensive film made in the Hindi film industry at this time. Um, so a third of that budget is a, is a huge amount, but that's obviously in part, yet yeah, transporting. I think they had a special deal with an airline for shipping the prints. Um, to give you an example, obviously John C. Kirani is, is not Lawrence of Arabia, um, but laboratory technicians who printed Lawrence of Arabia said that a single print of Lawrence of Arabia cost about the same as a three-bedroom semi 
in the 60s. Um, so that gives you a kind of sense. I mean, Lawrence Arabia, I think, was also widescreen, so it's slightly different, but um, enormous, enormously expensive in one sense, but then also one of the benefits of dye transfer printing, as I mentioned, is that um, operating at scale is incredibly cheap. Um, so basically, after the first 25 prints, it's pure profit. Um, so the question is that the, the lab are generating enormous profits. If you're making 400 release prints, everything after 25 is, is pure profit. Um, but obviously, if you're producing the film, you have to pay for all those prints and also um, to ship them. Um, as I mentioned, the, the rushes are in black and white, so it's not like they're constantly shipping color back. Um, but that may, hopefully that kind of lays out the field of the kind of economics of, of dye transfer printing a little bit better. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have some more questions online, but there's one, Danny, just behind you. <laughs> question. Uh, thanks. Hi, thank you both so much for your absolutely fascinating um, talks and discussion. Um, I was interested, Erica, in your uh, mentioning of uh, the British government encouraging working class men um, to work in colonial contexts. And it seemed that uh, there were lots of different uh, classed performances um, that you were looking at with your mother, perhaps in terms of aristocracy, celebrity, influenced by both press and screen. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about how class influenced your thinking about colour in that colonial context. It's interesting because I was, you're asking me a question that I was thinking about on the way here. I, I, was actually, I was actually thinking about the chapter on my father and how I'm going to approach it. And I think it will, it will come through in that context. Um, I think the answer is I don't yet know. I think that one, one answer to it is that um, is again a kind of spatial answer. Um, so that I think what happens, and it happens, I mean, one of the things I, I, one of the reasons why I want to travel across these different locations is that I think these processes of white racialization that I'm talking about occur differently every time. You know, the production of them as a particular, production of whiteness, the production of a particular class position, and so on, and the pr production of a relationship to independence in, in you know, that's not, n not so much an issue in the Bahamas as it is massively in, in Ghana when my mother arrives there in 1951. Um, it's a much more heavily politicized environment. Um, so, uh, but I think in every context, um, spaces and our sites are absolutely crucial. So in the Bahamas, Government House was a place where they had fashion shows, cocktail parties, um, you know, tea dances, all those kinds of things. So there was a rubbing shoulders of the British aristocracy. This was the period just after the Duke, the Duke of Windsor had left mm. as governor of the Bahamas um, with, with the local elite. That was very, very different in Ghana. Um, so I think, I think that, thank you, that's a really helpful question. I think that question of class in relation to whiteness will change in every context, but I think it is about sites of sociality. That's why I'm so interested in the cinema. It's just one last point on that. Um, that the cinema as a site of sociality in the Bahamas is utterly different from northern Nigeria where um, the colonial officials are living in very widely sort of far-flung areas, but they will come together at the club. The European club is, is the place where, again, the, the collection of people who meet there is different. So it's a different site of production of class relationships, class affiliations and, and whiteness. But thank you, that's a really important dimension. And of course, gender is in there too. Wow, thank you so much. Really fascinating. Um, actually, we have two questions about gender uh, and colour. Well, specifically the colour pink. Uh, we have just lost connection, so give me one second to try to retrieve the questions. Um, right, so <coughs> said the question's to Erica because it's about pink, but also to uh, feel free to chime in. Um, could you talk about the valency of pink in terms of gender and sexuality in post-colonial society? Um, 
um, Julian Forrester um, says that uh, my understanding is that pink was regarded as a masculine color until World War II, but acquired associations with gay culture and effeminacy during uh, during the war, notoriously in the Nazi death camps. Um, was the choice to use pink in post-war Nassau simply an estual of its most recently acquired connotations, or did it have other valencies? I think that depends very much on the, the, on the medium that you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about architecture, then pink has this long historical association with, with, colonial, with colonial architecture. Not just, I mean, I'm very ignorant about, about the kind of Spanish presence in that region, but I'm sure that's also, you know, Spanish colonial architecture also has a similar color palette. Um, so, you know, I think, I think, I mean, you say in your work, Kirsty, that, that you can't, attaching meanings to color is a really, <laughs> really, <laughs> an enterprise that's fraught with danger. Um, but certainly there, what you can trace is sort of relays and circulations, I think. Um, so there's a much longer colonial association, I think, when you're talking about architecture. Um, if you're talking about fashion, it's different. If you're talking about film, it's different. One of the things that I think was another point of connection between your work and mine, Kirsty, is in the, art, in the chapter that I read from you, you start off with maps, which are in a, a red pink. They can't be red because then you can't see the print, as far as I understand. But the, you know, red is, of course, the color of empire, but on the maps it appears as pink. That was actually one of the things that made my mother, as an Austrian child, <laughs> growing up in the rural Austria, fascinated by empire, because so much of the, map, the global map was pink, you know. So, so uh, I think, I'm, I'm, I think, I, I, I don't know if that's a very adequate question, but I do think it, you know, the map is different from the building, the building is different from the frock, the frock is different from the advertisement. Um, so that's why I'm sort of trying to look at how, I think, I think probably what's going to happen as I develop this chapter is that I will be looking at spaces. The beach is really important, I think, the pink beach. Um, and, you know, but I'm not quite sure how that will work. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I have absolutely nothing to add about pink because you beautifully summarized it all and, and hello, Gillian. Um, but I, I just wanted to sort of pick up on something you were talking about towards the end about the relationship between blue and pink, which is so important, that relatia, uh, relationality, the contingency of color, that there's something about its relationship to the blueness of the sky and the water that also makes it seem pinker, right, as kind of complementary colors. So that pink will look radically different if it wasn't in the Bahamian sun. Um, so I, I just think there's also this kind of in environment or kind of the question of like the, the climate that produces the color as well, which is so interesting. And the images that you use there, especially the, um, the sort of long one with the very big swathe of blue and pink, with the, just really kind of brought that out to me, seeing that image that it's, it's a question of kind of activation, which again speaks to this question about kind of sensory environments. And, and it's also so interesting for thinking about color Beyond, you know, Gillian um, raises these really important kind of associations that um, Pink has had, but um, thinking beyond that kind of colour symbolism of something being kind of activated by a particular climate and environment is, is such an interesting dimension for thinking about colour. That's really important, and I think the other thing to say about the Bahamas is the environment is blue and pink. <laughs> you know, the, the, the sea, the sky, it is, of course, heavenly. Um, the beaches are pink. There are pink pigs on Inagua, one of the, one of the, which are a kind of tourist attraction. There are flamingos on, I can't remember which of the other islands. All of these have also been, are also part of the contemporary iconography of, um, I suppose, Bahamian national identity. So the flamingo is a really, really important figure. So pink doesn't, ha you know, become something very different in different contexts. But yes, pink and blue, absolutely. Perfect. That's really interesting. Yeah. One more question, Mark. Thanks. Thanks for two great uh, talks. I just, I've re in relation to the 
overriding theme of the series about modes of art history and modes of writing. I'd really love it if you could reflect a bit more on two, both of you on different things uh, in relation to things that were striking about your presentations. One, I guess, obvious thing, Eric, is about your decision to use a family, to talk about your family and about your own, and to bring your own personal history into the kind of story you're telling. And what your reflections on that, on having done that and in, in the process of doing that, it's a it'd be very interesting to think about that in relation to voice and your voice and the voice of, the, of you as an author. And then for you, Kirsty, I'm really interested in something that's very striking about your presentation is about, and it's not, this is not personal to you at all, I think it's very common, but about the way in which through constant um, name checking to those theorists and writers that have been important to you, very much, you know, at one level almost speaking in footnotes, constantly or bringing the footnotes into your main text and talking about the kind of community of scholars that you work within. What does that do in relation to your, how, do you, how does that shape or structure your own voice as a writer uh, when you're so regularly and strikingly talking about other people's work in relation to your own? Interesting. <laughs> you go. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's a big question. <laughs> thank, thank you for the question. Um, so I think one of the things that I'm interested in as someone who works across the disciplines of art history and, and film studies very much and um, you know, I've previously spoken on panels at the PMC about the connection between these disciplines is how you make work legible to people from other disciplines, right? So um, very often I'm talking about film with film folks and I'm talking about painting with painting folks and printing with printing folks. Um, so how do you make that work legible to people who aren't necessarily in your field? Um, and one of the ways of doing that is saying, here's a scholar you're familiar with and care about, and here's a way of using them to think through this object. Um, another is, you know, debt acknowledgement, and um, particularly for thinking about an object like John C. Kirani, um, which, as I you know, mentioned, has this interesting history as a kind of Anglo-Indian object. Um, so using other scholars... Um, who've both thought about the history of colonial filmmaking in Britain and Technicolor, but also about archival issues in, in India as a way of approaching that object. Um, and what I hope is that this allows this object not to be kind of fall into a media silo, if that makes sense, um, that I would hope that um, this material is of interest to people who work on print <laughs> um, by thinking about the object as a print and citing print scholars and drawing on the work of people who work on print. So opening up ways of interpreting and speaking about objects um, to people from beyond those kind of disciplinary media silos, I suppose, is what I'd say. Um, but I'm, I'm far more interested to hear <laughs> about Erica's challenges of biographical work. Well, um, it is challenging. I, I, had, I, have a, I do have an answer to why I chose to do this, and it's because um, I've spent so many years not doing it, and I think that that's part of a whole silence. Oh, you know, that's the, I, I hate that discourse, actually. You know, nobody's ever spoken about this before. This isn't, that's not what I'm saying, but I do think that in the discussion that happens at the moment about um, decolonization, if that's what we're going to call it, a lot of recourse is to earlier moments in the history of the British colonial presence. What I know, because I grew up with it, is that many of the people who I've moved through my life with have, a, have very similar experiences, which we don't talk about, actually. Many, I've had many a conversation with white, sort of lefty liberal intellectuals, academics over the years, who said, oh, I don't really say this to people very often, but you know, I grew up in India, or my parents were in Africa, or, and I was, I think what energized this, I knew that I was going to do this work, um, anyway, but what sort of energized the book was a piece, a very short piece by Gary Young, you'll all know him, British sociologist, ex-Guardian journalist, black public intellectual, who wrote a piece in The Guardian um, in 20, 
16 or 17, the date is significant, um, and he was talking about, he was tracing some of the family histories of some of the figures who've supported, um, uh, who supported Vote Leave, for example, or Leave EU or whatever, and all of them had this family history, a very recent family history. So I think there's a notion that when, empire, when decolonization happened, when, in, when there was a move to independence, that somehow, somehow people of my generation and later didn't have that entanglement. But I think it is very deeply there. Um, so that was the decision, really, was to try and speak about that as a, a history yeah, the history that has shaped me and my generation. Um, finding a voice for it is incredibly difficult because I find uh, I've read a lot of colonial life writing. Um, and, you know, there's a way, I've, in a way, I shouldn't be showing this photograph because there's a way, you know, it's very quickly, it very quickly becomes an exoticizing tale of colonial adventure. And I don't want it to be that. So often my parents fade out of the picture. And in fact, when I go to Ghana, um, my mother will be displaced by somebody else um, who I get my name from, actually. She was also called Erica. Um, and so it's an intensely personal story, um, but it's a story where I try to I try to fade out these figures often, and talk through them and around them. But also, that's your question, Shreya, to try and work out you know the people they nearly met but wouldn't have met. And I did, for example, in the Bahamas, in interview one of the nurses who was trained by my mother, which was an extraordinary experience. Um, so I'm trying to work out sort of intersections so that I'm it's like making almost making my parents a kind of negative space and building the space around them but they are of course also there they're, you know it's not an entirely a void um. thank you um we might have uh, questions still and thoughts that are percolating around the room but um we're sort of getting to time and I think we have um a glass of wine next door, so that would be a good moment to sort of uh, say a big thank you to our speakers for today and then join them, talk to them in person and keep the conversation going. So thank you.